It's time for a Drummer Nation. Slim Jim Phantom grew up listening to his parents' jazz records and started playing drums at the age of 10. By the late 1970s, he was playing in bands with his school friend and bassist Lee Rocker. They soon joined forces with guitarist Brian Setzer to form the band Stray Cats. The band spearheaded a rockabilly revival by blending the 1950s Sun Studio sound with modern punk musical elements. Jim often performed standing up using only a bass drum, snare drum, hi-hat, and a crash cymbal rather than a full drum kit. Their high-energy shows brought an updated, heavier sound to traditional rockabilly music. We'll find out what he's up to now, next, on Drummer Nation. The former Crescent Vanguard series are now widely available as part of the legendary Sabian HH models. HH symbols are traditionally hand-hammered into shape and sound by Sabian craftsmen. Each symbol receives between 2,000 and 4,000 hammer blows, resulting in increased musicality, tonal complexity, and unmatched sonic texture favored by drummers in the know for generations. Find out more about the Vanguard series and all other Sabian models at Sabian.com. Sound Synergies Percussion Care Lubricants and Conditioners include a series of three products for total drum kit care and maintenance. Pedal Lube, the only product specifically designed for bass drum, hi-hat pedals and triggers, as well as all moving metal parts and drum hardware, safely removes grit, grime and other contaminants while protecting against harmful friction wear. Cymbal Care, restores and conditions cymbal surfaces without strippers or harmful polishes. Stick marks and fingerprints virtually disappear while branded ink logos and the symbol's naturally aged patina are left intact. Wear Barrier is a conditioning formula for all drum heads, rims, and even sticks that prevents excess wear and maximizes sound quality. Every Procussion Care product complies with all USA air quality and safety requirements. Procussion Care products in your gig bag ensures your entire kit will always look and sound its best. For more information, including a detailed video explaining the science behind Sound Synergies products, check out their website at soundsynergies.net. Hi, this is Stanton Moore. I've been playing and teaching drums for over 30 years. Growing up in New Orleans, I was fortunate enough to have some of the greatest drum mentors and teachers in the world. Because of this lineage, I'm as passionate about teaching drums as I am about playing and have written multiple award-winning drum books and DVDs. Recently, I decided to modernize my approach to teaching where my students can have access to my latest ideas and I can finally answer all the questions I get about drumming, gear, and more. My new site, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, is the perfect online drum learning platform for any level drummer to learn how to play the drums the same way I did, with the advantage of having me road test the material on hundreds of stages, countless clinics, lessons, and master classes, and dozens of studio sessions every year. Subscribe now and get ready to make serious progress on the drums. Imagine how much you can learn in just a month or two. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you as subscribers on the site, and I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. Slim Jim Phantom, welcome to Drummer Nation, and thank you for doing my show. How are you? Thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah, everything's cool. We haven't met, but I was you were highly recommended to me by a mutual friend, Ricky Rocket. Oh, Ricky Rocket's my buddy. That's why, uh, yeah, if he vouches for, for it, it's cool with me. Well, anybody he vouches for is cool with me, too. So <laughs> let's start briefly on the early days. You were from uh, Massapequa, New York? Yeah, that's on Long Island, yeah. Right, and then you studied with Mousy Alexander, which I found interesting. For people who don't know, he was uh, made his bones on the Benny Goodman band. Yeah, Mousy was like a local guy. He was I, we were kind of fortunate to have him in the neighborhood. Really, he was a few train stops um, over, and I, I honestly can't remember how I found out about him. But I but I knew uh, maybe someone else took lessons or heard about him. But um, he was an actual one of those guys. He had a goatee, and he had. Oh been to japan with benny goodman and he uh, and he said daddy O and hip guy he, he really was that guy a jazz hipster yeah yeah and, and, you know. now he put you through traditional type drum instruction i think i read somewhere you went through the chapin book the ted reed book probably uh the the, the stick control book is that was that yeah, i tried to do chapin maybe i got through first 10 pages or something uh yeah ted reed book for sure which anyone can kind of practice along to it's still it's still a good one. Um, uh, yeah, you, yeah, a few of those books, maybe like a Mel Bay book, or maybe when uh, Louis Belson it's got uh -huh. an orange white cover. Um, I had done in a less before I started with Mousy, I'd done Carmine's book, you know, or the ones that I could do from it. 
Yeah, I think um, I think everybody went through the Carmine book, and it's still yeah. it's still out there, man. He's just revamped it. He's just no, oh, he's he's awesome. I met him when I was like still in school. He was doing a clinic at Long Island Drum Center, and I was just some kid, you know. And he was very mm-hmm. nice. And a few I, years later, we had a success of our own, and I met him again, and told him he didn't remember but we've been friendly ever since he's he's a good guy i met him when i had a cymbal company and he was he was a great guy still is a great guy and uh, yeah I, I, he loves the drums and he does that's the thing all these people have in common that i try to get across on this show is that you know whatever style you're from if you're I, I try to cover people who are artists who are educators who are media people who are manufacturers it starts and ends with everybody has a intense love for the drums yeah, that's the only thing I think really matters. I mean, I, I, I still like to geek out over, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. if you meet any other drummer, you can talk for at least half an hour about a wooden tip versus a nylon tip. Or, I know. You know. A friend of mine. Duh. Or 5A. You can really, if you get stuck at dinner with someone and, oh, you're a drummer. Okay. It's, well, a friend of mine, Don Bennett, used to have a story that said, uh, you put two drummers in a room and before you know it, fun breaks out. Yeah, and it's... I. I don't know because I'm only a drummer and I've only been a drummer my whole life. But maybe if you put two guys who are, you know, into insurance and this, I, I don't, <laughs> don't know. I think there's more of a I bond with drummers. I mean, but just to, to someone else, it's probably equally as uninteresting, you know. But uh, well, for it, me, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I mean, was always that guy. I always looked at Zildjian catalogs and made little notes on the side of, you know, I, uh-huh. I always loved all of it so yeah i think we all came up that way so let's talk about your early influences because you came up as a rockabilly guy i imagine when you were a kid you were listening to what buddy holly chuck berry i mean how'd you come up yeah that came a little bit later um uh, again well, was late that was in our late teens we we started the straight cats we were all like just out of school um uh i came up just wanting to play the drums and i i didn't really care so much i or like i didn't know enough to about so I liked what was ever on the radio and whatever records I could lay my hands on. I had a few older cousins who, um, who, um, who had albums. And who could afford an album, really, when you're 12, 13 years old? Um, so I would borrow records and whatever they had. So I had one cousin. She had Billy Joel. So I listened to Liberty DeVito, Long mm-hmm. Island guy. Mm-hmm. And then my other cousin had the Stones live album. And I still love Charlie Watts. And um, my... Uh, my mom had the first Beatles album. I listened to Ringo, of course. So whatever you could kind of get. Um, I had another cousin who had Yes, Close to the Edge. I couldn't play as good as Bill Bruford, but like I liked that and would try to practice a little. So any record I could practice along to is really what I liked. Um, and I came upon one of them had uh, one of the middle Steely Dan albums, and I love Jeff Beccaro was my favorite guy. Um, uh, well, I was just going to mention Jeff Percaro because he's one of those guys who really learned by playing along with records. Yeah. Uh, I remember that from an interview years ago. Just what, really whatever I could get. You know, my same cousin who had the Stones had Derek and the Dominoes, and Jim Gordon was always a favorite drummer of mine. And, mm-hmm. and really just kind of following your nose and like what record leads to another record kind of thing. And then, um, so I I was that guy. Lee Rocker was uh, was my neighbor. We And um, he was a bass player. So we just always played together we like uh, mick fleetwood and john mcvee's rhythm section things like that we would just mm-hmm. practice together um bass and drums and we would just go any opportunity to play keg parties or rec dances or um uh lee had the house that was the garage and that we i i left my drums there and had a practice pad kid at home um well, so you know i just stayed together always still you know and um uh one thing led to another. And well, that I have. The, that's what I want to ask you. You and Lee were playing together. How did the, the Stray Cats get organized and come together as a band? Uh, we we all went to school together. So um, Brian was a couple of years older than us, where and he was always hotshot, excellent guitar player, musician guy. Um, but when you're third, and Lee's the same age as me. But when you're 13 and someone's 15, it's kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. But older you get the less those two years matter right. so by the time i was 17 and he was 19 it didn't really matter anymore kind of thing so um we started playing the stray cats i think i was about 18 just turned so brian would have been 20 it didn't really matter everyone had a car and had a you know had an id you know kind of thing mm-hmm. um and um and the willingness to do it so by that time we had um uh lee and me from things like the Allman Brothers, I guess, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, uh, Clapton, 
what 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 was the classic rock of the day? I'm a little bit, I think, drummer world too. You geek out over album liner, and I just wanted to know. Uh, uh, the Stones did see uh, uh, Carol, see see Barry. Who's that? <laughs> um, on on one of the Clapton albums, it was well all right. Who's B Holly? And you know, just uh-huh. the who Eddie Cochran. They covered a song by E Cochran. C Perkins was on a bunch of Beatles records. So uh, that and. Um, you know, the blues guys that we learned from the Allman Brothers, who's uh, T-Bone Walker kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. from the... So, like, we just did the natural research and really landed on that. And rockabilly music, when, uh, I had the added... Um, the added uh, in benefit of really falling in love with the look of it. And um, uh, I just didn't know about it, to be honest with you. I was, you know, always trying to be a fashionable guy, but, like, in the late 70s, you would have tried to have been fashionable to look like, you know, Clapton or, you know, Keith Richard or something, which is still great. Um, but when I found Rockabilly, it was, it was a whole built-in thing. It was a beautiful thing. When I we finally arrived at Elvis Presley's first recordings and first photographs, it was like a revelation, really. And we, uh, we just wanted to look like that. We wanted to play like that. We wanted, and, and there was other guys in the neighborhood who were finding out the same stuff. So we just found each other and so we played you a lot. Started doing gigs around New York. Yeah, we played Long Island. Uh, uh, we played bars on Long Island. There wasn't that much of an established rock scene on Long Island. There was a few places, um, but again, we were kind of too weird. It wasn't even punk rock, which never really caught on on Long Island. It wasn't even new wave. It was nothing that it had been seen before. Mm-hmm. It was a very um, strange thing, and um, you know. What do you do when you don't know what something is? You reject it, right? So, so, um, so we found our own scene. We made our own scene, really, playing in um, regular bars that we would put all the equipment to my car and um, you know, the bass and the you know, sticking out the back window and a little PA and a drum kit and uh, us across the front seat of my um, uh, Pontiac, 1966 Bonneville, which fit all the gear and the band. Um, and uh, we just made our own scene. We played five nights a week, uh, four sets a night all around Long Island. And once a month, we'd go into the city and play CBGBs or Maxes, trying to get a record deal kind of thing. Right. And because um, uh, uh, you, know, you couldn't really play there more than once a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were doing you know, very well. We had a following. Kids who didn't look like us weren't rockabilly types. They were just regular looking, you know, fast times at Ridgemont High looking people or <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, just regular you know, whatever burb kids there were kind of thing, you know. Um, well, you but, were the only guys but, looking that way at the time and sounding that yeah, way. You came up with a very fresh look and sound. People. Yeah, but we had this following of people that didn't dress up like us. Or, uh-huh. They did that kind of plunge, but but they loved it, and they followed us around. And we had a couple hundred people every night, so we were li- making a decent living. And um, uh, so it was all good, really. It was like we were the local eccentrics, and, you know, we slept late and had – money in our pockets and our, that's a great uh, story for the young players coming up of, of guys who nobody had heard of they had their own look their own sound they're throwing all their stuff in a, in a car and, and just making it work from, from the get go just from hard work and dedication well yeah that's what it is really to be honest with you I, I, I think you have to believe in something right and you know mm-hmm. it's kind of lucky that I had you know the two live near me um, but I was um, uh I was determined that I was going to somehow make a living from the drums. Even if it was going to the city and working at Manny's in the drum department, anything that I could have a pair of drumsticks sticking out of my back pocket and talk about, you know, the bell size of a cymbal to it. And like at that time in my life, I would have accepted that game it's, on. It's a, li- it's a life commitment and it's a total immersive thing that you have to jump into well, if I you really want to do it. At, at a young age, we could all play pretty good and had all taken lessons and, um, uh, you know, we made a dent in the pop culture. We had a success with it. Um, but, uh, but so anything that was, um, some type of living from playing the drums, I was, um, I was completely. Well, let's move past Long Island. You moved to LA first or (laughs) to to London? Um, on, on a whim, really. Um, we, um, we kind of heard that there was a scene, you know, King's Road and the Clash and the Sex Pistols and that there were Teddy boys who were, you know, that they were more hip to American um, rock and roll. And a lot of the stuff we got the influences from, say, the Beatles or the Stones or Clapton, even though we weren't musically, we were a little bit beyond that. 
we knew that there was somehow an awareness of it, where in New York, nobody knew who Gene Vincent was and Eddie Cochran, even though they mm -hmm. were American artists. So, again, you're 19 years old, it's summertime, we had some money, let's buy a ticket to go to London. Okay, and we went to London. Well, you soon became accepted by uh, British uh, royalty of rock and roll, right? I mean, I, I've read that uh, uh, Jagger and Keith Richards and, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Beck and all these guys would be showing up to your gigs. Yeah, it was, um, we got there and, you know, luckily it was summertime um, uh, so, because we had no plan. We had no money to stay, you know, you had a thousand bucks, right? On, on Long Island, you were rich. When you get to England and you're, you know, a thousand bucks, you know, isn't really last very long, even in 1980. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we kind of lived homeless almost. Well, we did for a little while. And couch surf found squat houses like in Sid and Nancy and you know that kind of world and we um, we just really knocked on doors and tried to get a couple of bra uh, gigs we wound up knocking on enough doors and every town needs bands and you know uh, after a while so we we got opening act third on the bill fourth on the bill at a pub where you start at five o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> so by the time we got a couple of those gigs uh, we was bugged the people that we had. Like we were gravitating to parties or any place you could get in for free or whatever. A little gang that we had fallen in with, and bugged these people to come to the gig. And and I think half it was let's go see these guys play from New York. Maybe they'll go home. Maybe they'll shut up for a little while. But a lot, the few of those people that originally that we had known were Lemmy, Chrissy Hine, Joe Strummer, Glenn Matlock. It, it's that gang of people. Mm -hmm. And they came, and of course it was really good. We just needed to have the chance and um and and how did you end up in la from there was it a record deal uh, well we got a record deal then like people like the rolling stones started to come out and they 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 loved it back uh robert plant whoever those old guys who we found rockabilly through they loved it like we had an instinct that they probably would like mm -hmm. you can't have a plan to go i'm gonna play a gig and all the all the stones are going to come and then right. you know, Robert Plant's going to you know, invite me to life. You can't really plan it that way. But I had, a, we had an, in, you know, an, in, an intuition that, um, that those guys would like it because that's where they came from when we were correct. So, um, so that built up a big kind of hubbub. Um, you had shared influences. They were coming from the same place. Yeah, exactly. Um, where like a lot of American groups from that era didn't, you know, like right. you couldn't really hear the influence of Johnny Burnett, say on, uh, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, but you could hear the influence, uh, of Eddie Cochran in the who kind of, you know, it was a funny thing. Right. Um, so, uh, when those kind of people start to come to the gig, uh, it, it got a national attention and then we had a record deal and we met Dave Edmonds who turned out, who was like a big, uh, big star of the show who knew how to, cause we hadn't ever really in a recording studio or anything like that. So, um, um, so he knew how to, how to record us. He was like Sam Phillips waiting for the right artist to do mm -hmm. the sound he had in his head. Um, and again, English cat, uh, you know, Dave's Welsh even, and, uh, um, just really knew about American music and, and we had a hit record and, uh, this would have been lit, uh, the end of 1980 into 81, and 82, we just toured Europe, Japan, Australia. We put our toe in the water a little bit in the States, but the record hadn't been released in the States. It was a, a deal based in London. What was the record? Uh, the record was called Stray Cats. We had Runaway but Boys, Rock This Town, Stray Cats, there with three top, top, top 10 singles from it in right. every country. You're, uh, England, France, Germany, Australia, Japan. Uh, so we spent about a year and a half, almost two years touring that. And in the middle of that, the Rolling Stones asked us to do part of the 81 tour with them in the States. And nobody knew who we were, really, but we went out every night with them. And they were very nice to us and you know, helped us as much as they could. And then 82, summer of 82, uh, they got, we got a re uh, release on the record in the States. Mm -hmm. and, that, just really and that's when it exploded here. Yeah, we worked very hard. We just went and toward for two, three years, whatever it was, you know. Oh, and I, I fully remember that. You guys were everywhere. You just exploded onto the scene. And you still hadn't moved to L.A. at that point? Uh, well, I had moved to L.A. Uh, well, at that point, I didn't really have anywhere to live. I lived in hotels in London, and we uh, we knew that we were going to go and make a big thing in the States. Uh, 
And I had been to L.A. a couple times before that we had done a TV show and we had come through with the Stones. And I just, when I came to L.A., I said, I'm never going to leave, really. Mm -hmm. And my things were in storage in London and we were pretty much on the road always. So when we decided to um, to make a go of it in the States to really try hard, I, I just stayed in L.A. So you guys became an integral part of that uh, Sunset Strip scene from the early 80s, right, with the... Uh, Troubadour and the Roxy and the Rainbow and uh, Gazaris yeah. and all that stuff. Or you had already yeah, you were already was, bigger than that when you moved there, right? Yeah, that was uh, that came a little bit later, and that was you know, you know, glammy, um, you know, hard rock, whatever they called it. Um, right. That was a little bit later. That was in like eighty five, eighty six. We had come here in eighty one the first time, uh, but by eighty two we were playing the Palladium, and yeah. it, it kind of kicked up a little bit because we were getting played on K Rock. That was the big station out um, here. Um, I remember K-Rock. Um, uh, yeah, they were playing us as an import. It was part of the whole crazy story. And um, uh, so, but, so 85, 86, we, we had already had a success. And when that stuff started to happen, I mean, I already hung out at the Roxy. has been there since the 70s. And the Rainbow and the Whiskey had been there a long time. Right. So um, they, they kind of played host to whatever scene was kind of, kind of happening. So, um, uh, but well, I was a I, guy. I, I, I like to hang out, and so I, I, I was at these places, and I became very friendly with a bunch of those guys. Nikki Six was my friend. Tommy Lee, Rocket, uh, um, Steve Piercy from Rats, still my friend. Like mm -hmm. a bunch of those guys. That's the guys who hung out. There weren't really that many rockabilly people, really none, besides me. Right. Uh, so, who like hung out and uh, uh, you know? Well, that's what was so interesting about it. You had the punk scene happening. You had the new wave scene. You had the the rock stuff coming. Van Halen was already on the scene. Later on was Guns and Roses. You guys had your own sound and your own thing, and and really, were, were kind of a fresh voice for rockabilly that sort of updated it. Would you say? Yeah, and and kind of by the time those guys came around, like the Stray Cats are one of those groups that pretty much everyone can agree on. It's not really, it's it's not really controversial in any way. Mm -hmm. It's like American rock and roll that's been accepted by all the way up the you know chain of rock royalty kind of thing. Um, and everyone knows how to play very well, and it's a cool look that's never really going to go. If you put on a t-shirt and a leather jacket and stick your hair back, you're never going to really be out of style. So um, yeah, you're or, cool forever in every society. <laughs> that's always cool. So, um, and then me, because I was fr I I was the outgoing one. So I was friends. With, you know, Slash is still a friend of mine and Duff. And we we all kind of just you know, hung out and mm -hmm. it didn't really matter. Again, if what, what type of music you played, if you're like a you know, musician guy or especially a drummer guy, all drummers can agree. I think I'm friends with every drummer from every one of those groups we've mentioned. So it's, well, it was really certainly a fertile scene and you guys had a lot of camaraderie and a lot of deep friendships that, that, that came out of that, I'm sure. Yeah. And what we were doing still, no one else really did it. Like out of the scene on Sunset Strip, um, oh, quite a few bands, came out of it i don't know any other rockabilly groups that kind of came out of a movement because right. we were a little bit like we came out more rather than a you know a musical thing we we came out of an early mtv like a visual and you know the music was there for people mm -hmm. that wanted the scene that we broke out of was kind of that early mtv world so we were um we would have been more played on the same time as, say, Adam and the Ants or someone like that, more than, I don't know, any of the rockabilly groups that really came along. Right. Um, now, let's talk about the music itself. You're a drum set player, but you have an interesting kit. First of all, are you left-handed? Yeah, it's funny because I write with my right hand and play the drums left-handed, like fully. I could, from years of having to do it, if someone calls me up to play a song, I can sit down and play right-handed but i don't feel comfortable doing it i can't really do anything fancy but i, but I well, keep like yeah in my natural habitat i stand up and play left-handed yeah so what led to the standing up to play that was certainly there was nobody doing that when you guys hit no um what we see when we started doing it again it was things weren't so so accessible now with the being able to get online so quickly is um, so we were basing everything that we are our lives on like a few records that we managed to find and the and the blurry photographs that would have been on these records. Right. So um, uh, so we loved um, uh, uh, Gene Vincent, the Blue Caps. 
Bebop Lula, you know, and um, mm-hmm. uh, there was a, the first two records, Gene Vincent and the Blue Caps, they could, there was a couple of snapshots on the record, and the drummer, who's still my friend, Dickie Harrell's his name, Bebop Harrell, played on Bebop Lula, and that's him doing the, you know, the scream song, that's him. <laughs> I didn't know that. Dickie Harrell, he's still around, Norfolk, Virginia. And um, uh, uh, so there were, so he was standing up, and so we uh, we thought it would be great to, but still in the back, you had to really get a magnifying glass and look to see what these pictures were. And uh, so in the early days of Stray Cats, we played a lot, so we had a little time to experiment with something, and let's make it like this picture where the guy was standing up, okay. And then our contribution, which no one ever did, was we put the drums in the front, which even the big band guys like Buddy Rich or Krupa and all the guys that I loved so much, they were still a little bit behind the band, you know, off to the side. It was, there was no one that I knew of that was in a front line. Um, it was a so, great visual, first of all, and then that, it put the drums yeah. right up in the front with the three of you as equal partners in a trio, and uh, it really worked. And it was that the first time you had played stand-up drumming? Yeah, I, I did, you know, maybe in school when you played a snare drum kind of thing, um, but... A whole drum kit, yeah. There's a little bit of an act to it. You got to learn how to do it, like anything else. Um, but we played a lot. Like I said, we did five nights a week, four sets a night for you know a while. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now let's go over the kit though. You had a bass drum, uh, which you play with your left foot, uh, a, a snare drum, a, snare and drum, a ride cymbal, and a crash cymbal, right? Yeah, I added the crash cymbal maybe the late eighties. <laughs> right. But, but um, yeah, for the and then I, and then I had a floor tom. You know, if we did stuff that was like, you know, Buddy Holly influence, Peggy Sue, that kind of tribally. Yeah, uh, Krupa Tom stuff. I would bring a floor tom on and off. Well, I never missed it, though. When I hear hear that music, I, I you know, if you close your eyes, nobody's ever going to say, well, that's a non-traditional kit. It's solid. It rocks, man. And, and Well, that's what it was. Yeah, that's like a good point because I, I didn't, it was really... No smaller than, say, you know, what a lot of the jazz cats were doing, or what, you know, mm-hmm. it's just really how you set it up. Um, <clears throat> because there wasn't, and you know, something this there seems to have been a little bit of a um, move back to it. I see groups now, guys have very small drum kits, they sit down, but like, you know, maybe some high snare drum and one crazy looking cymbal and a low, like they're trying to make the kits different. I have a kit I call my micro kit, it's, it's that kind of thing, it's a sit down kit, but it's tiny. And uh, you see, uh, Questlove has one, I think, on that TV show he does. They're they're coming back. You know, drum sizes go in and out and up and down, and they're always changing. But let's talk about the grooves you were playing. You played a lot of sh- shuffles, right? I know Stray Cat Strut and Rock This Town are shuffles. Um, Stray Cat Strut and Shuffle, Rock This Town, it's all kind of the same. Um, it's it uh, swings, is what I'm getting at. Or like a chape in, like a you know dot eight and sixteenth with a quarter note on on the one. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, so, so there's there's a swing to your sound that that I it really dig. Um, yeah, positively, that's the that's the trick to it. It's got a swing and it's got a rock, and I don't know how to notate it or explain it somehow. But I mean, your drummer, you know, it's got a rock and swing at the same time. Well, that, that, that's kind of what I was getting at. You hear the old swing style in it from from uh, jazz, Dixie, um, you know, Krupa esque, and then you also hear just some heavy rock and roll stuff in there and, and it, it, it works. You found a magic mix that works for you and works for that band. And how, how did you approach the shuffles? I know sometimes you're doing two-handed shuffles, sometimes you're playing like a ride beat with the right hand and different um, stuff with the yeah, left. That one, there's like a few things that I, you know, five or six things that I know how to do and a few of them I I can totally bring back to the original stuff that I learned from you know, my first lessons in the music store and then mm-hmm. from Mousy and that's one of the ones in Chapin um, that um, uh, he keeps a ride, dotting 16th quarter note on the one kind of, um, but has has a um, has a shuffle, which is dotting 16th, dotting 16th in the left hand. The, that, the snare drum right? hand, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and like I could do it. And it's a little bit, it pushes the band. I do it a lot of times in a guitar solo, mm-hmm. and it excites everybody, and mm-hmm. it kind of, um, uh, it kind of is, is like, li- I use it, personally, as like a little bit of a high gear sometimes. And it's, uh, you know, it's one of those ones that I can always go to. Well, you found a spot for you that's unique from everybody else that, that works so well. Uh, you've had such an interesting life. You had a, a, didn't you have a club on the strip for a while, the Cat Club? 
Uh, yeah, long time. What was that all about? Uh, well, that was at a little bit of a funny time in my life when I wanted to get off the road a little bit. My um, um, my kids were young, and I, I didn't really want to travel that much, and I don't really know how to do that much. I've been doing this my whole life, and I lived for a long time. My kids grew up, my son especially, on right on the, um, on the Strip, and it, it – there was a funny opportunity on Clubland always just to get involved with this nightclub, and it was by where I live. You know, you can make a little bit of money and not have to go on the road and kind of stay home. I mean, as wacky as it was, it was pretty normal. We would walk to the cat club after school, and they would do their homework at the desk, and I would do my <laughs> business. And then at night, you know, so it was a little bit of a um, you know rock and roll attempt at a had a regular life um disguised as a normal person was a comedy album years ago i like um but you've such an interesting life beyond that i mean you married a a movie star you climbed mount everest and mount kilimanjaro uh yes everest we went to base camp advanced base camp they call it because after that you have to get you know oxygen and ropes and spikes and all that but yes we did um uh, we got to Advanced Base Camp, it's called, Everest. Yeah, it still takes two weeks, and I, didn't, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> I mean, then, what, what, what made uh, you want to do that? Kilimanjaro peaked it. Sorry, buddy? I'm sorry, you, you peaked Kilimanjaro? Yes, that one we didn't peak. Uh, um, what made you want to do that? Uh, well, it was a little bit... Um, a, a, a dear friend of mine plays in a band called The Alarm, Mike Peters, and uh, who were the first opening act on the first Stray Cats tour. We've just stayed friends literally 37 years. Um, and he, um, cancer survivor guy, and he was, uh, when he went into remission for the second time, he wanted to give back a little bit, was organizing this thing with rock and rollers, and uh, that's the thing he organized. And I had agreed to do it with him and, you know, kind of regretted it, but I already said yes. And um, so... There was a charity involved, right? There was, yeah, Love, Hope, Strength, cancer charity. Right, okay. My, uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it was a good opportunity to do it. I'm, I'm glad I was a little bit younger. Um, I mean, that's some dangerous shit. You can, can die up there. Yeah, it was, um, we had people helping us, but, again, what? It, no one can walk for you. I don't care if you're the... Mm -hmm. Prince of Wales, if you're up on the side of the hill and you say, I don't want to do it anymore, well, it's really not, <laughs> okay? You still got to get your ass up and down on your own, yeah. you got to either go forward to meet the gangs, or you can, you know, you can <laughs> freeze to death on the side of the hill, you know? It, it, it's pretty much up to you. So, you know, we went along, and there was a couple other rock and roller guys that we were all, you know, friends, but we did have people helping us, but still, you got to... It's you. You got to walk for eight hours straight up a hill every day for two and a half weeks. And well, then, uh, what, was it worth it in the long run? Yeah, well, I did it, I suppose, when and we're talking about it. But yeah, yeah, I guess. In in hindsight, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's moment, quite a challenge, and you did do it, you know. There's got to be some reward from that. Yeah, in the moment, you're just happy it's over. But yes, <laughs> positively. Um, and it's a little... It's a bit of a brotherhood, you know, the people that, they, they, there was like a few rock and rollers, and, and my, the guy from, um, Glenn Tilburg from Squeeze was on it, Cy Kiernan from The Fix, Mike Peters, um, Robin Wilson from Gin Blossoms, myself, and then there was about like 20 other people. What people a cool, who, like, dangerous idea. Uh, you do have an autobiography uh, that you've penned, uh, A Stray Cat Struts, My Life as a Rockabilly Rebel. Yes, and that's what we're trying to get at. It's a very fun story. It's on St. Martin's Press. It's not some little indie book that you're going to have to look for um, that hard. They have it at Barnes & Noble. And, uh, oh, it's on Amazon. It's also on Amazon, yeah. But if you're, if you're walking down your main street and you got a Barnes & Noble, I think it'll be in there. But um, we've, uh, that's what I really wanted to do, you know, to get this wacky story across. It's, it's really not just about... You know, anyone could go in the bathroom with the rainbow and do blow with Lammy. It's like I did a crossword puzzle with Lammy in the back of the car, you know, on yeah. our way of rockabilly to go play a gig somewhere together. Uh, just it's kind of a unique thing. Yes, we own a nightclub on Sunset Strip, but my kids were doing their homework when there was, you know, punk rock bands playing downstairs. <laughs> it's just like 
It's a little bit of a twist. I'm going to pick it up. I'm sure it's an interesting read. Now, I wouldn't, uh, it's a pretty short format here, so I'm not going to keep you too much longer, but I, I won't let an artist go without asking, in spite of all the great things they've accomplished, I know you're still playing. What are you doing now? Well, there's lots of stuff going on now. Um, I'd like, I'd like the book for a start, um, but uh, I still play a lot. I've been, uh, I've been playing with a trio that I still go out and hustle up the hustle up the rent and the dog food um, uh, doing that. I just can't, I, I played last week at Pittsburgh, week before that, Detroit. This coming weeks I'm going to Knoxville and to... Uh, are you freelancing or these are your bands? Um, I've, it, it kind of depends where I am, to be honest with you. I have a band I use in the States. There's a band I use when I go to Europe. There's, uh, I was in Australia about four months ago. I have a fantastic trio there. Um, and again, I just go and I do my thing. Um, I can play the Straight Cat songs and I do um, some other ones and I've had to learn how to sing sing for an hour mm -hmm. and I always tell the people I was the third best singer in my band so be um, <laughs> be patient with me but I've gotten pretty good at it to be honest and uh, we do that that takes up a big time and um, uh, I do a side a classic side band called the Jack Tars and that's made up of Captain Sensible from The Damned mm -hmm. Chris Cheney from a band called The Living End Mike Peters and myself, and we've been doing that for quite a few years. We've been doing gigs. We always get guests. Last time we did it in L.A., we did the Troubadour, and Duff McKagan came and uh, pl played with us, an old buddy, and um, uh, the guys from the Pogues came up, a couple of guys from the Foo Fighters, Rami and Chris. Uh, so we just, and that's the thing that we want to make a record for, and everyone's kind of struggling to find some time. I think we're going to do it in January because I'm going to go do some shows with The Damned in England. All of what I really want to do is stay home and watch baseball and hike my little dog with um, with Steve Jones and Billy Duffy, which we do most days. I'm a baseball nut and I love my dog. So uh, we have that yeah, in common. Let me know when that record comes out. I want to help you promote it. And, yeah. and also, uh, well, you and I have never met. So you're in LA. Next time I'm out there, I owe you a beer or a lunch or a hang or something. Call me but... anytime. I'm the easiest guy to find. Just, you know, email now. Just or t I, I, I talk to everybody. You can, yeah, even me. <laughs> you can, okay. you can count I mean, on I that. Stay in touch with me. I, I always, uh, I stay in touch with everybody. Well, like I said, any friend of Ricky's a friend of mine, and and yeah. you certainly are articulate. I, I stay in touch. I'll see him probably. Um, we reconnected through um through Leica cameras. We both uh, got involved with them. Oh, okay. Leica and um. And so he goes to the openings the same as me, and we always wind up, hey, yeah, yeah. And then we <laughs> don't pay attention to anything else, talk about the drama. So, well, I'll add you to my friends in LA, and I can't wait to hang with you one day, and we'll have a good time. Yeah. Thank you for Just doing the show. You got it. Slim Jim Phantom, everyone. Uh, I'll put some notes about your website and all that in, in, in the. Yeah, there's Show official notes. Slim Jim. There's always funny stuff on Instagram. I find all this great stuff. I have boxes of because I was late to the whole thing of doing it all, and I and I went to my stores. I have Instagram for ten years. Uh, there's all sorts of good drum stuff, and uh, uh, you know SlimJimPhantom.com, StrayCatsMusic.com, and just. There's all sorts of funny stuff. All right. We'll put it in the show notes and, and yeah. uh, maybe on the screen, too, if I can do that. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you again someday. Thanks, Michael. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. This is your host, Michael Vosbein, and I'd like to thank our friends at Sabian Symbols, Sound Synergies, Stan Moore Drum Academy, and Classic Drummer Magazine. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.